Hi, this is Scott Garibay, and today I'm going to be talking more in depth about the box journey. Uh, so the box journey is specifically looking at every single Dungeons and Dragons basic set box that has been published from the beginning to current in a consistent uniform manner. So I want to sweep through them real quick just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. Each one of these is a Dungeons and Dragons basic set box. So the first is the 74 Gygax Brown. Then you have the 76 Gygax White. Then you have the 1981 Moldve Red. Then you have the 1983 uh, Menser Red. Then you have the 1991 Denning Black. Then you have the 2006 Tweet Black. And then you have the um, 2010 Hainsu Red. And then you have the 2014 Merle's Green, okay? And uh, one of the things I'm realizing now is that it, they really do sound like wines, right? Like, and, and I think it's okay to think about these like, like wine because each one, I, I need to be careful here because I'm a teetotaler, so I don't really know anything about alcohol, but I do know a, few, a little bit about wine as far as how people deal with wine, right? So there are sommeliers. There are people who are experts in wine and they are knowledgeable about specific vintages, right? And that and that's what these box sets are for us. They are vintages. And just like wine is grown in special places, and there are special people who are you know, who are really expert at bringing out the best from the vine. You know, each one of these designers was really uh, did a great job of bringing out the best of what the original source material was from Dungeons and Dragons. So these are our vintages, you know, and I and I think that's important. And I to think about these, you know, as valuable assets, each and every one of them, right? Um, and yeah, so all right, so let's talk about this. So I actually really love the idea of the box journey. I'm getting more and more interested in in that. Um, I really like this idea that we can start to look at Dungeons and Dragons and this arc of game design that goes through this, this arc of Americana, right? This arc of American history, this arc of, of um, rules construction, right? Uh, there's all these things that attach to these boxes. So let's start talking about them. So the first thing I did is I wanted to just think about it and say, if you think about the historical the historical aspects, the game within, if you think about each box set in its point in time in history in Dungeons and Dragons and what it meant to the community at that time, right? What is the word that attaches to each box? Okay. So I'm going to go through and talk about them. So to me, um, the, the Gygax, so the 74 Gygax Brown the only word that can be attached to it is Genesis. It is the beginning. It is, um, it is, you know, it is the source. It's what, you know, it's the root. It's what everything grew from, right? Uh, the 76 Gygax White, that is specifically a prestige, right? Now, at this point, um, you have, uh, so at this point, one thing that's really interesting is, it is very clear if you read uh, the guy, if you read the seventy-four Gygax Brown, the second the second sentence in the seventy-four Gygax Brown is here is something better, right? <laughs> You're like what? <laughs> you know, like Gygax knew then that he was holding on that that he had the tail of a tiger, like that what he had built was going to change the world. And, and I love that. I love that, like, you know, Gygax was incredibly self-confident. He, he, he was self-aware. He knew that this thing wasn't just going to flitter out, that this was going to catch fire and, you know, and just burn through the creativity of every awesome mind in the country. You know, like, and it was, and it was really interesting. It was, it, it was an interesting time. But the, the, the second box, the, the 76 Gygax White, right, that's him, like, just saying, okay, we're here, man. Like, this is our prestige product, right? And really just, just like, fully embracing that not only was he at the beginning, but, like, you know, we have something special here. So I really feel that the word prestige fits the 76 Gary White, 
Okay, the 76 Gygax White, excuse me. And then I think I would say the next one, the 1981 Moldvay Red. This is innovation, right? This truly is innovation. And so what you're seeing here is a very distinct view from someone new on Dungeons and Dragons. So uh, Moldvay was, uh, you know, Tom Moldvay was a really special guy. He really understood Dungeons and Dragons, and he did a, a much better job of kind of sweeping everything that was there and and putting it together, and then also creating. I would say it was innovative in the idea that Gygax could have still had his fingers in the pie, and he knew enough to step back and start letting other people build on this, right? And that that's so so important, right? I, I right now. I really feel that's the difference, you know, right there. Tom Moldvay is the difference between Star Wars and Harry Potter. You know what I mean? Star Wars is huge. It's probably the biggest intellectual property in the world. And it's much, 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 much larger than Harry Potter. And the reason why is, you know, Harry Potter is still really, by and large, J.K. Rowling's creation. And very, very, very few people have been allowed to even touch it. So Moldvay was the first guy where, uh, where where Gygax was stepping back and someone else was coming in. And one, I do think it's important that Moldvay wrote this because Moldvay D&D, if, if you're not aware, is uh, it's a term, it's a thing. And there are a lot of people who really dig Moldvay D&D. And by the way, uh, you know, and he, he was doing Rules as Written even then. And um, you know, rather than uh, Guidelines to be Followed, which came in the Menser back box, the next box. But it was really innovation in that Dungeons and Dragons was not going to just remain Gary Gygax's baby. It was going to be the, uh, the the mental playground of some of the greatest minds in the country. And I, I think that was really important, right? So I really feel that Moldvay was innovation. And it's really important that, that someone else... It, it is, it's important that Moldvay was there because it, it really is a brilliant interpretation. But it's also important, like anybody else, it would have been important that you broke the mold and that somebody else was writing other than Gygax, right? Um, and that that is just critical. All right. So let's talk about the 83 Mensa Red, okay? The 83 Mensa Red is classic. It is the red box. You know, it's got that um, it's got that Elmore cover. It is like, you know, it's a barbarian slashing at the, ta the, at the fangs of, um, you know, the dragon itself. Uh, it actually also, when I say classic... It is the first game to go to uh, go to guidelines, you know, guidelines to follow rather than rules as written, and so that that's a really big one. In that, um, even now today, people think, oh, well, the game master can really do anything. That's a huge debate, but it is classic D and D now at this point. And, uh, and, but any, you know, but I think when you hear, uh, when you hear an OSR person talking about early D and D, most of the time, the one that everybody was at, the other thing is the 83 Menser red, there was tons of it. Like it was not hard to get, you could get, you know, you could actually get it. Whereas all the ones before this were, you know, they were, they were published in all these weird, uh, ways and things like that. But the 83 Menser red was a great interpretation. It was highly available. Uh, it was accessible. You could just take that box and run, and it was awesome, you know. And so, so I really feel like the '83 Mensa Red is a classic. That is, that is a word that best describes it. All right, so let, let's let's keep going forward. So, at this point, let's talk about the '91 Denning Black. All right, so you're in second edition at this point. All four of the editions I just talked about. That's all one E D and D. Right, '91. So now you move on to 91 Denning Black, right? And what is uh, the word that, that, that best descri describes it? And I really feel that word is anchored, right? At this point, uh, you know, you have, you know, this is in 89. So you have 15 years of Dungeons & Dragons. Dungeons & Dragons is huge. I mean, mil like some people estimate in the, in the 90s that there were 10 million Dungeons and Dragons players. 
which is frankly higher than there are now. Most estimates right now, I think a year ago, you would have been safe there were to say there were two or three million D and D players. It is it is hard to tell right now because I really think we are in a resurgence. And weirdly, Stranger Things has done a lot to push Dungeons and Dragons forward. Um, and so you know, but but at this point, like in '89, you know, Dungeons and Dragons have already been out in like um, ET, right? You know, like it was in ET, in, which is like very similar to Stranger Things, right? Uh, in that, you know, it was it was really wild. So at this point, the 91 Denning Black, what that is, is it is anchored, right? Like, this thing is bolted to the ground. It's not flailing around. It's part of the of the zeitgeist. Uh, you know, Freaks and Geeks talks about, you know, um, talks about playing D&D in the 90s. That's Judd Apatow. Judd Apatow has affected, you know, American comedy for... 10 or 15 years now at a huge level, right? You know, and that American comedy has gone out into the world, right? You know, so, you know, f- you know, the, the, the direct, when I say D and D is Americana, that is not an exaggeration. It is like a red Coke and Cola, you know, vending machine, man. You know, you're, you're like the lines are, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, Freaks and Geeks, Judd Apatow, American humor in Thailand. I mean, like, you know, it is Americana. It is an export. It is, it is huge, and it affects our culture, right? Um, and so it's it's a really big thing. Uh, so I would say that you know you're you're really looking at at the anchor, uh, the anchor as in this is a you know this box is showing a, steer, a a period of stability for Dungeons and Dragons, not just growth, but stability. Okay, All right, and, and it's it's staying in one place for a while, and it would stay in one place. For you know, it would stay in one place, you know, for all the way up through. Um, it, it took a while, so the ninety-one, you know, the ninety-one Denning Black, it would stay in place all the way up until the year two thousand. Second edition would go all the way up until the year two thousand. So, really, is anchored. All right, so now we got a big jump, right? So now we're going all the way to the 06 Tweet Black. Okay, the 06 Tweet Black. At this point, you're in third edition. What is the word that most attaches to uh, the 06 Tweet Black, third edition, right? I'll tell you right now, 3E. Um, the prosperity, without a doubt, right? This is this is it. Like, this is like third edition went bonkers, right? And not only was third edition selling like crazy at this point, but you actually were looking at uh, because of the OGL, the open gaming license, you are looking at other companies getting money, lots of other companies getting lots of money. Uh, lots of money is put in the air quotes of the T- of the TRPG industry. But uh, so not only is D and D doing great, but all these third party vendors are doing great because of the open gaming license. And the open gaming license, it, you know, I, I don't think re- people have really uh, people have talked about the OGL. But I just don't think people understand how important the OGL was overall. And, like, in that, um, you know, it was really Dungeons & Dragons saying, listen, everybody just chill, listen, right? We're Dungeons & Dragons, man. Like, we, you know, you guys can all live in our world now, right? Like, it was just fully owning that it was the absolute three three crowns on the head king of tabletop role-playing games. And, you know, it was just like... You're in my world now, like that. It was just D and D owning its its vastness, its awesomeness, its epicness, and its heritage and its history. And also, I, I do want to say, uh, this was a little, this one hurts a little bit, but um, it's a special box to me. The the 06 tweet box is special because it's the last box that Gary saw, and. Um, and that, you know, because he, he died in 2008. And and I under, I fully understand the history of, of Gary and all the dish editions of his game. But, you know, that, that box was there when he was alive. And the next box, right, and it's almost foreboding that we're going to talk about this. But I, I really think the word that is, that is attached to the 06 Tweet Black is prosperity. 2008 comes and uh, Gary Gygax dies, right? And then, so the 10, the 10 Hainsu Red. 
the Tan Hainsu Red. We're in fourth edition. The the word that I attach to the Ten Hainsu Red is Wasteland. It, it was a Wasteland edition. In that, by the way, I loved I loved fourth edition. I thought it was an awesome an awesome edition. I really enjoyed it. I one one of the best. By the way, one of the best tabletop role playing game players in the world is a guy by, by the name of Curtis. He plays some games on the internet right now. Um, I don't, you know, I don't want to give his full name there, uh, but um, he, you know, I met him playing fourth edition, playing a lot of fourth edition, and so I love the rules. But what I did not like about fourth edition, I, and the part that nobody can argue, is fourth edition fit, uh, split the community. So here you have the first box created after guy after Gary has passed, and you have a box that has tried to really change fundamentally. Dungeons and Dragons, and it was just, it was a mess. It didn't work well. So, uh, and then last, I want to talk about the, um, the 14 Merle's Green. And the word that I would attach to the 14 Merle's Green is resurgence. And we're in that resurgence right now. And that's, uh, me talking a little more in depth about the, um, the box journey. Thank you.